Welcome to The Law, Your Money, and You. I'm Roberta Sapphire, an attorney in Sharon. And I'm Camille Barron, a financial advisor, also here in Sharon. You know, Roberta, when employment comes up today, most people think of unemployment because it's so high. But actually, there's a lot of things that people need to recognize when they are either looking for a job or have a job or if they're terminated from a job. So today, we have with us Paul Izzo, who's an attorney here in Sharon, and he's going to be sharing with us some of the concerns, some of the pointers that people should be aware of, whether you're looking or have a job or have been terminated. Welcome. Thank yes, you for having welcome. me on the show. Thank Before you. we get into that, we have to tell the viewers that he may look familiar because mm -hmm. you have your own show on Sharon TV. That's right. Sports Nuts? Yes, mm -hmm. Ken Berman and I have uh, had a show, Sports Nuts, for almost 20 years. My Ooh, goodness. So you guys have a ways to go. Before uh, you yeah. Start, but you're oh, well you look on your so way. young. It's keeping <laughs> young. Well, why don't you start by telling a, a little bit about yourself as this part of the law, that part of you. Well, sure. Thank you again for having me on the show. Uh, I've been an attorney for about 25 years. Uh, I met my wife, Debbie, in law school at Syracuse University. She's also a lawyer. That's where my kids uh, went, too. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, I had a wonderful yeah. time there. She, uh, she practices U.S. Customs Law, um, but I've been representing um, primarily consumer product companies for the last uh, 20 years, companies that sell products to Kohl's and Walmart and Kmart. Uh, and I also represent uh, major companies that do promotional products and services, employee recognition products. And in that capacity, I also, um, here in Sharon, represent uh, individuals who get involved in employment issues. So that's why I'm here today, is to talk a little bit about that. We'll try to keep it the employment mm -hmm. issues, but sometimes I have a tendency to go off somewhere else because it, when you said a husband and wife law team, we're a husband and wife law team, and Camille's a husband and wife team, but, but yeah. she does an inventory program. It's but funny, she's a I would financial say financial person. We rarely talk about the law at home between yeah. kids and, and other things, but uh, yeah. it, it's a nice thing to have in common. Sure. Well, yeah, you well, start. Why, why don't we start first with, we're talking about employment law, and I think that your position is that it's a relationship between an employee and the employer. That's and right. And you kind of describe three stages of it. So That's what's the right. first stage? Well, I think, as you said, employment law is a relationship between employee and pl employer. And like all relationships, it has its beginning. Uh, a very important part of the relationship is finding a job, looking for a job, or from the employer's perspective, perspective, looking for the right candidate for a job. Much like in a relationship, uh, you know, it has to have a beginning. Um, once the employment relationship is established, you have things that go on during the relationship. You have promotions, you have discipline, you have people feeling like they're being unfairly treated, you have compensation issues. And then, like so many relationships, you have an ending. Um, sometimes the ending is a happy one, uh, when an employee perhaps moves on to a better opportunity. Or you have a change in the employee relationship, where an employee may get a promotion. And then you have those difficult circumstances, which we'll talk about, where an employee has to leave the relationship, um, either on his or her own, or against their will, um, you know, a termination. So, um, I think one way to think about it in, is, is to think about it in, the, in that respect. And there's also, in the, in the employment world, you have the perspective of the employee and you have the, the perspective of the employer. The employee's perspective is to get the job, to be as compensated as you can be, uh, to have as many op fair opportunities as you can get. Uh, the employer's perspective is a little different. Um, the employer wants to make sure that they get the right people and they have maximum flexibility with regard to um, uh, compensating them, um, promoting them or not promoting them, and then, unfortunately, from time to time, terminating them. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have all that in the mix to talk about here today. So let's start with the emp seeking employment and beginning the relationship. What are some of the common issues that people should be aware of, things that you might have seen? Well, the general rule in, in virtually every state is that um, an employer is free to make a hiring decision for any reason or no reason, so long as it's not an illegal reason. So an employer can discriminate. I hear people say, you can't discriminate. Sure you can. You can discriminate against someone on the basis of their experience. You can discriminate against people on the basis of whether you like them or don't like them at the interview. 
But there are things you cannot discriminate. You cannot discriminate against someone because of their gender or their religion or their sexual orientation or you know, other protected age. things. Their age, <laughs> that's correct. So uh, you have these things, but when people say, as a general rule, you can't discriminate, sure you can. It goes on all the time. An mm -hmm. employer will get many applications, and what they do is they will choose among those alternatives uh, when proceeding. Now, some of the things that I'm seeing nowadays more and more and that I think our viewers have to be concerned about, let's start when you look for a job opportunity. Is it real? What do you mean? Um, more and more, we're seeing situations where people are being scammed into thinking that they're actually applying for a job. Now, if you think about your, your resume, your resume has a lot of very confidential information on it. It has where you went to high school. It has where you went to college. It has what year you graduated. It has all of your employment. All of that information would be very useful to someone who's trying to steal your identity. Oh, okay. Is that mostly through the Internet, though? And, it is. And not through, a, like, a newspaper ad? Do people still look for jobs through newspaper ads? Or just they do. Places? They do. Still, um, mm. particularly in the professional fields, lawyers, for example, will look at Lawyers Weekly or the National Law Journal. But by and large, many, many people, particularly mid-level professionals, and there are many of them here in Sharon, will look on Monster or Hot Jobs or on Craigslist, uh, web-based uh, employment searches, and more and more we're seeing situations where people will actually be scammed into thinking that they have applied for a job when in fact all that's really happened is they've turned over their personal information. People are particularly vulnerable for this when they post their resume online, which people do more and more. They just post mm. it where, where they believe employers are looking at it, but actually other people are looking at it as well. So how can one protect themselves against that? Well, you can make sure that um, what you're doing is applying to a reputable company. One thing that I've recommended people do is apply, maybe look for an opportunity on Monster or on Craigslist, but only apply with the company itself. Go on the internet site for, say, EMC, look in the careers section, and apply for the job directly on EMC, not some search firm or middleman or other organization that you might find on the internet. Mm. The alarm bells definitely should go off if the age, if the person on the internet, the company, asks you to pay money to apply mm -hmm. for the job. We're seeing people that will say, "Well, there's a processing fee for handling your application. It's twenty nine ninety nine. So that's the bell. Alarm bells should go off. There are very few reputable companies that I have ever heard of. In fact, I've never heard of it where you actually have to pay to apply for a job. Are you better off than going through an agency? Because there still are. There are employment agencies, but the fact is that's not realistic, Roberta. Nowadays, most people will find work looking for companies on Monster or Hot Jobs or these other sites. Um, there are specialty sites that only look for lawyers or only look for engineers and things like that. Now, what about what kind of information is the employer, the prospective employer, entitled to? regarding the applicant? Well, one of the things that um, is a very hot area of the law right now is whether or not an, em an employer can undertake a criminal background check. Now, it's interesting the way the law works. There's been some re very recent statutes passed in Massachusetts having to do with this. An employer can have information about your criminal background. So, in other words, they can go get it from legitimate sources, like a Corey check, or from a criminal background search, but they can't ask you about it. They can't ask you about whether you're, you know, have you ever been convicted of this or have you ever been convicted of that. There are some exceptions to that rule. There are some jobs where it's recognized that you need to know if somebody has a criminal background. But for your typical employment situation, the rule in Massachusetts now is employers m usually should not be asking people about that. Now, the, other, the flip side of it is what happens if the employer finds out about something in a criminal background? In my experience, it's not a fatal problem. Um, many people have criminal convictions or charges in their background, and they're often able to explain them. So the, the job of a person who has something in their background that they may not be uh, crazy about 
have the explanation ready to, to give the employer, uh, explain honestly and openly what occurred. You know, I was young and I made a mistake, I had too much to drink one time in my life, whatever the explanation is, and be for, uh, forthcoming with it if it's relevant to the employment decision. Now, if, if an employer decides not to hire this person, if it's on the basis of what they found in the criminal check, is that legal? That they could refuse to hire somebody because of that? Well, as we said at the beginning, it's because an, an employer can <coughs> make a decision for any reason and no reason, so long as it's not an illegal reason, I'm not aware that making a decision for that reason is an illegal reason. What I do believe is no longer permitted is to make ask questions about it. Um, so I think if an employer were to ask questions about it and then make that decision based on that reason, that would violate the new statute. I, I have a question because uh, I, uh, you know, we have a business. We interview people, and there was a uh, a girl that we were going to hire, and she said she got a job. Actually, it was a job for one of the car dealerships, <laughs> and she was just going to greet people. And then she called me up a few weeks later and said she was let go because her credit report was not good. And they told her that's why they were letting her go. I, I, I never heard of that before. Well, companies do, in certain circumstances, credit reports on individuals. And so long as they give the employee notice of what they've learned and what they have found, um, I believe that they have um, done what they're supposed to do under the law. You well, do see that more and more, particularly with people that handle money or that may have responsibility involving money, um, that employers will run credit checks on them. Well, what about our average? You started out about an average homeowner and Sharon and people that are getting laid off, and we know they're getting laid off everywhere, including Sharon, and then they're having a hard time paying their bills and they go uh, look for a job. I mean, what do, what do you suggest to get around that, or is there no getting around that? Well, there's no getting around things that employers can find out from public sources. Um, so uh, the best thing to do is to be open and to have good explanations for the things that you may not be happy have occurred in your life. Um, with, once an employee, once a person gets an offer to get a job, and whether they haven't made the decision yet to accept it, or to, to uh, take the job, um, make sure that you understand thoroughly the benefits package. I've had more than one person tell me that after they took their job, they didn't realize that the new job didn't have as good health benefits. You know, the, the employer would say, you have, we have Blue Cross Blue Shield. That most companies will have a benefits package, and before you accept the offer, you should sit down and carefully review it versus the package that you had at your old company. But Seems like a no-brainer, but people don't yeah. do it all the time. But while you're reviewing it, somebody else grabs the job. Well, it depends <laughs> on how long you get to, uh, <laughs> to accept. But um, make sure that you request copies of all the documents that you're going to be asked to sign the day you show up. Um, a lot of people show up their first day at work. They're all excited. They go into the HR department. And a lot of papers are put down in front of them. And some of those papers have very significant legal issues in them. Non-compete agreements, for example. Let's say that you're in a particular industry. You're, you're sell, you sell food, and you accept a job in a food service company. When you arrive there, they may ask you to sign a document that says, if you're terminated for any reason or no reason, you will not compete in the food service industry. You need to know in advance, before you accept that job, whether that's something that you're going to be okay signing. Because if you lose your job, you may, be pre you may be precluded from working in that industry for some period of time. Is there a reasonable period of time afterwards? Like, say it said 10 years, that might be unreasonable. Would the whole thing, they can just forget about it? I'm or? comfortable saying that 10 years would definitely be considered an unreasonable period of time. Mm -hmm. But there, to my knowledge, there is no hard and fast rule and I've seen companies have very good success in Massachusetts enforcing non-competes that were reasonable in duration. And by that, I mean six months oh. to a year, um, particularly if they're reasonable in geographic scope. So you can't compete in eastern Massachusetts, or you can't compete in this targeted industry. Would that mostly be um, for salespeople? Uh, no. You see it in... Uh, any position where there would be sensitive information obtained. 
that might give you a customer advantage. So, for example, an IT position, you might see a non-compete, or even an operations position, you might see it. Now, what about intellectual capital? Let's say that someone works at a company and they have contributed ideas, or maybe they've, they came up with some brand, brand new idea that was very successful in the company. They leave the company with or without a, a non-compete, let's say without. Who owns that information? Well, there's a general, uh, like all laws, as you know, there's a general rule and then there's uh, dangerous exceptions. But the general rule is, uh, it's called the work for hire statute. And the work for hire statute mm -hmm. says that if you're an employee, your, your boss owns your ideas, to make it simple. So if one of the employees of Sharon Community Television came up with a great idea for producing a program, and they went and they tried to patent it, uh, Sharon Community Television could say, uh, no, we own that idea because you came up with that idea in connection with your employment, and any ideas that you generate um, will be owned by us. Mm -hmm. the, the wrinkle there that you see with a lot of companies is when companies hire uh, people as independent contractors. I'm just going to ask that. Uh, then, what the ownership of the intellectual property is actually governed by the agreement that's entered into between the employer or the, the, the company that's hiring the person and the independent contractor. And sometimes the independent contractor will say in his or her agreement, um, I'm doing this work for you, but if during this, this time that I'm doing the work, I have a brainstorm and it's a great idea, I'm going to own that idea or some part of that idea, and you're only going to get to keep a license to use that idea. So uh, small businesses that are hiring independent contractors would be very smart to read very carefully uh, the agreements that they sign with the independent contractor, because there could be interesting wrinkles in Yeah, this. what would happen? I, I know a situation like that. The fellow worked as an independent contractor for 10 years. Uh, he was an electrician. He took the permits out in his name, and then he decided, well, I, I'll go in business on my own. And the company says, well, you're an employee, so... Mm -hmm. What what I, I I know the answer I I well, want I, you I, to I, tell I, me the now answer. Now you're saying if he's an employee. Well, they're saying he's an that's employee. Different. They're they're in trouble. If well, they, if, if if he's if he wasn't being treated as an employee, they probably are not going to win if they weren't no. keeping payroll tax you know payroll taxes and so forth. Uh, if he re if this person really had the status of an independent contractor, uh, I would question their likelihood to succeed. Yeah, there. I'd I'd like you to go into. On the employer's side of it, what, when they hire somebody, what they should look for. Maybe they could hire somebody. Is it better for them to hire somebody as an independent contractor or as a, an employee? And would it behoove someone who's out of work to go to a, an em, employer and say, well, you know, why don't you hire me as an independent contractor? Well, the em we'll if independent that. of the intellectual property issue, if that's what you're asking me, uh, there are benefits mm -hmm. to employers for hiring people uh, as independent contractors, particularly if they do it through an agency. One of them is it's just easier. You bring the person in. If you don't like them, you can tell the agency, I want somebody else. Uh, you don't have to give them benefits. There are all these advantages <coughs> to hiring someone as an independent contractor. The flip side of it is the law does not allow you to abuse that. At some point, um, the law will say, no, this person is not at... One, one of the true hallmarks of an independent contractor is they're not being directed in their day-to-day -day operations. They're, they're truly independent. So we have to separate what we mean by independent contractor and temporary employee. Temporary employee acts like an employee, um, looks like an employee, can take direction from their boss. Um, at some point, the law does not allow that temporary relationship to go on forever. It, does, it just doesn't. The law will step in and say, no, you're avoiding payroll taxes. You can't just have a, this person on your, your staff forever. They d just don't allow it. In the case of an independent contractor, the independent status can last a longer period of time so long as the independent contractor is truly independent. Mm. See? Well, like a lot of companies good, good have IT guys okay, forever, software uh, guys on the staff 
that are just independent contractors. They don't get benefits, what have you. They can be told the project's over tomorrow and just and told to go okay? home. And that's okay? That's okay, as long as they're truly independent. They operate independently on their own. Now, let's Again, all this is general. Let's move on to know. during the employer-employee relationship. So the person's been on the job. You have things like performance reviews, mm -hmm. might be other things. What, what are some of the concerns in that arena once the person is on the job? Um, I think it's very important that employees and employers alike stay on top of the review process. Let's look at it from the employer's perspective. Let's say the employee handbook promises that on an annual basis, I'm going to review you. And then I don't. And a couple of years go by, and I haven't given you the, the annual review, and we've talked about it and joked about it, but it's never happened. And then I decide that I'm going to terminate the employment relationship because I believe that the employee has not done a good job. Well, the first thing the employee is going to say is, you're wrongfully terminating me. Mm -hmm. You're terminating me for some reason independent of my performance, an mm -hmm. illegal reason. I won't have anything to defend myself. Mm. I won't have any employee review that says, well, I pointed out a year ago that I was a little concerned about the quality of your work or, the t or your reliability. For that reason, it's very important that an employer have, if they have a review process, that they follow it. Conversely, the employee hey, Joe, you're doing a fantastic job. You're doing a great job. You'd like to have that in writing. Mm. Because if, there's, if you're getting a positive review uh, in the hallway, as it were, uh, better to have that somewhere documented in your employment file. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Employment records are actually an interesting area of the law. There's a new law in Massachusetts that says mm. that if anything negative is put in an employee's file, he or she must be notified. Now, that's a pretty wow. interesting law because mm. it puts, on the bur puts the burden on, on the employer to know what's negative or potentially harmful to the employee. Mm. So anything they should put... Anything that they, they put negative in the file, the they have to notify the employee. And the employee now, twice per year, can ask for his or her employment file. I want to look at it. I Isn't that when they it. usually look for the raise, too? You know, the review, two-month review, yeah. two-month review, a year review. Well, mm -hmm. I want my review because that's when I get my raise. Mm -hmm. it, it is typical, uh, but it's interesting you bring that up, Roberta, because more and more companies are trying to separate the review process from the income oh. discussion mm -hmm. because people just zero in on the income discussion. Yeah. And <laughs> it's, it's, okay, but what's my raise? Right. Uh, whereas the uh, companies are getting very creative with reviews. They're doing them quarterly or they're not doing them at all or they're doing it on an informal basis. So you see a lot of different things out there in the world. That's interesting. interesting. So yeah. is there anything else regarding the active employment stage before we move on to the final stage, which unfortunately happens, and that's about to be terminated or are terminated? Uh, well, one thing that I think we should mention is that in Massachusetts, there is an organization called the Commission Against Discrimination, the MCAD, which is, a, which is a f an agency, a state agency that will uh, accept uh, complaints from employees who believe they've been discriminated against in connection with their employment. Mm -hmm. Do they have any power, or are they just in? in no, they do. They have they, they have power, and they, and and some of their decisions can end up in court if if it oh. gets really serious. But um, people can file complaints with the Massachusetts uh, Commission Against Discrimination if, for ex uh, example, a person feels that they have a. Li uh, a legally protected handicap mm -hmm. and that the employer has not done enough to accommodate that handicap. Mm -hmm. Employers are obligated to make reasonable accommodations to people that have uh, disabilities or, or legally protected handicaps. So if a person just needs mm -hmm. their seat to be a little lower... Or their the dog, mm -hmm. you know, the dog to be with them. Or their dog to be with them. Now, now if, if the handicap is so significant that the employee can't do the job at all, most employers aren't obligated to go all the way to accommodate that. But as a general rule, um, people with disabilities should be uh, accommodated. I, I have a uh, question, and, and then, because I think we have to end, we have to have you come back. But say somebody hurts themselves at work, they collect workman's comp, and they're out for like a year, and meanwhile, the job's been replaced, and now they say, well, the doctor said I can go back to work. Is, is the company obligated to take them back, or what, what did that I person do? I think it depends. It, it depends. It's, it's very hard for me to say that 
companies, most companies in practice will allow people to come back to their job. But people that have very, very long-term disabilities in connection with workers' comp, serious, significant disabling injuries are at risk to not get their jobs back. That can What does happen. that poor person do? You know, they had to fill the job. What, what they, happens Well, in that? some cases, they, they don't have a remedy, because I don't believe that the law requires the employer oh, forever interesting. to hold a position open. Because some people can be disabled for many, many months and years. Well, there's, there's, there's a million topics. There's one thing that de definitely comes up a lot, and that's age discrimination. Now, we know that, that there are reasons why somebody isn't hired, or if a company is downsizing, they may let some of the older people go. Yeah, because they don't have to pay. Them but how do they? The how can somebody who feels that that's happening, how can they prove that that's the reason? Well, the best way for, if it, from the employee's perspective, the best way is direct evidence. So if somebody says to you, "I'm letting you go because you're too old to do the job," how many people are going to do that? You'd be surprised. <laughs> that does happen. There are wisecracks made. There are statements made in email. There were statements made to oh, other chicken. people in the organization. I don't think she can do it anymore, those sorts of things. Paul, we have to go to our We've Got to Be Kidding segment. Please, I'm looking forward to that. We didn't get to termination of employment. We're going to terminate Aww. this discussion. Well, we, <laughs> we have to have you back because we besides the termination of employment, there's uh, uh, college students, older people, the Walmart greeters, uh, the young people, the little kids opening up their own stand. But you know what this is? This is when people in employment, I don't know if they can see that, but people are out of a job. A lot of people start their own businesses. And this is uh, a new business. It's a uh, chicken diapers. And it's, it's for real. <laughs> you got to be kidding. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. It's, it's for real. And there is also, this is in an entrepreneur magazine. And uh, the person had pet chickens, and they found that it was dutying a lot. So they made diapers. And I want you to know the diapers come in all different colors, maybe nine colors, and they're $9 <laughs> um, a pair. And uh, that's <laughs> chicken diapers. Well, and I, change, I change many diapers in my but day. But not our never did a chicken <laughs> diapers? No. And here's another one, th speaking of employment. In Tokyo, there was a oh, takeout okay. pizza chain hiring and the requirements were aged over 18, no experience, uniform provided, and the salary, $31,000 an hour. Yeah, I, I, I think I'm going to tell you. It's legitimate, but we have to follow it up to mm. see if it was a typo, but mm. I, it probably mm. was right. there. So it, I know we're going to wrap it up. I just want to say one last <laughs> thing. On pay, pet waste removal, another one in there, it's called duty calls. <laughs> Okay, so we need to wrap up. Okay. Um, thank you so much. There's so yes. much more we could talk about, and we'd love to have you come back. I'm sure, sure. we're going to get lots of emails about this issue. Oh, yes. So, everyone, please remember that, that we want to hear from you. Please send us your emails and let us know what you think of the topics we've had, if you have questions, something you'd like to hear. I, I was just thinking of a, an email I got, but I'll, I'll save that. But remember, we need those emails. We want to know what topics you want. This was a topic called for. And remember, this is your show. The law, your money, and, and you. you.